Spinal anesthesia was the first regional anesthetic technique to enter mainstream practice, and this was followed by epidural anesthesia, both of which remain core skills for all anesthesiologists up to this day. But at the same time, we've seen tremendous advances in the quality and safety of general anesthesia, and we've also seen the resurgence of interest in peripheral nerve block techniques. So one of the questions to start with is, what is the place of neuroaxial blocks in modern anesthetic practice? These are the advantages of neuroaxial blockade over general anesthesia that our trainees are often taught to spell out when we're discussing the options with patients. The one that I often caution trainees against overstating is avoiding the adverse effects of general anesthesia. Recovery after a general anesthetic with modern volatile agents such as sevoflurane and desflurane is extremely rapid. Just witness the thousands of day surgery general anesthetics that we administer every day. Nausea and vomiting is one of the side effects of a general anesthetic, but with appropriate chemoprophylaxis and perhaps a total intravenous anesthetic with propofol, the risk is really quite low. So most of these are short-term and relatively minor considerations and benefits. The advantages that are most compelling for me are the predictable physiological effect of neuroaxial blocks, which provides in most instances a simple and safe a uh, simple and stable intraoperative and recovery phase of anesthesia. The physiological change that results is one dimensional. There is vasodilatation of the lower torso and legs, for which we have in turn a very effective treatment, vasopressors. And this is why I think many of us intuitively pre prefer a spinal anesthetic in someone with complex cardiac or pulmonary issues. In addition, avoiding airway management has gained an importance in the era of COVID with the concerns over aerosol generating medical procedures. So this is currently one of the most popular reasons to consider a neuroaxial block over general anesthesia wherever possible. Of course, neuroaxial blockade also has its own set of adverse effects and limitations to consider. Fortunately, all of the serious complications are very rare and can be avoided with proper patient selection. Posterior puncture headache, for example, with spinal anesthesia is very rare if using small gauge needles especially if they are pencil point tips. One potential adverse effect that sometimes is overlooked is transient neurologic syndrome, also known as transient radicular irritation. This is becoming more relevant as we see a move towards more day surgery spinals and the use of short acting local anesthetics. Transient radicular irritation is probably a better name as there are no actual neurologic deficits associated with the syndrome and it typically resolves within two to five days. It's characterized by moderate to severe pain that's usually burning in nature and located in the lower back, buttocks and thighs. So you can see why patients might find it concerning. However, they should be reassured that it is relatively harmless and will resolve. It is most often associated with lidocaine with a risk thought to be similar with the other low short acting local anesthetics such as mepivacaine and chloroprocaine. However, there isn't a huge amount of data and in our hospital, we use mepivacaine as our short-acting local anesthetic of choice because we believe the risk is lower and in our practice, I must say we hardly ever see it. It is rarely seen with bupivacaine, ropivacaine and prilocaine. Nevertheless, the reported incidence does vary widely and this is probably because there are other contributory factors. The most important to note, I think, is the surgical position with lithotomy being most strongly associated and I would personally always use bupivacaine in this setting. Another adverse effect that can be overlooked, mainly because it occurs after we hand over care to the PACU, is urinary retention, which can require catheterization or delayed discharge. This is one of the few outcomes for which general anesthesia has a clear advantage over spinal anesthesia. Over distension of the bladder during the period of parasympathetic block, causes transient detrusor muscle dysfunction and thus an inability to void even after the spinal anesthetic resolves. There are, however, some steps that can be taken to minimize this risk. Avoid bladder distension by encouraging the patient to urinate before entering the operating room, by limiting the amount of fluid that is given, if possible, and by trying to match the duration of spinal anesthesia to the duration of surgery. There may also be a role for the prophylactic use of a drug called bethanecol. This is a cholinergic agonist used to treat detrusor underactivity and incomplete voiding in elderly patients.
Finally, modern surgical practice is very much about enhanced recovery and fast-track pathways and same-day discharge. For patients who ambulate or do physiotherapy, there must therefore be complete resolution of motor and sensory blockade, which can be a lot longer than the duration of surgery. This will obviously delay early mobilization and same-day discharge. You might be wondering after all this, therefore, if there are any compelling reasons to routinely perform neuraxial blocks in one's practice. The answer is yes, and I'd like to highlight several areas in modern practice where I think it offers potential value. The first area is pediatric anesthesia, where I must confess that I do not have personal experience or expertise. However, I would recommend this excellent review to you, which was published this year in the journal Anesthesia as a part of a free to access supplement of regional anesthesia. The authors highlight the concern that has arisen regarding the potential central neurotoxic effects of general anesthesia on the developing brain. Animal studies have shown that exposure to volatile anesthetics can cause neuronal apoptosis and behavioral changes. They do this by directly activating the mitochondrial apoptosis pathway and causing excessive calcium ion influx and release which overload and damage mitochondria. At the same time, I must emphasize that a large multi-center RCT has shown that this is not an issue with single, short-duration general anesthetics. There was no difference in detectable cognitive function at ages 2 and 5 years following either general or regional anesthesia in infancy. However, the preclinical data indicates that neuroapoptosis is dose and time dependent, and therefore it may be a potential concern in very young children undergoing repeated and prolonged anesthetics with one definition of prolonged duration as anything more than three hours. One could also ask if there might still be more subtle learning and cognitive deficits that were not picked up by the assessment tool used in this randomized control trial, or that would manifest later on in life beyond the age of five. These concerns have renewed interest in spinal anesthesia as an alternative. Spinal anesthesia is actually very safe in infants as their sympathetic nervous system is underdeveloped and thus hypertension is rare. Respiratory compromise from an excessively high block is a concern, but is uncommon with appropriate dosing. And in fact, the data suggests that these patients often don't even need supplemental oxygen. This is further helped by the fact that they do not need supplemental sedation in the majority of cases and will sleep peacefully through the procedure. The most common applications are in lower abdominal and lower limb surgeries. The authors do note that the duration is generally limited to 60 minutes or less, which somewhat negates the benefit over a general anesthetic. But combined spinal caudal techniques have been described for more prolonged surgery. Probably the main obstacle to infant spinal anesthesia is provider anxiety regarding the level of skill required for spinal anesthesia in such small people. And I confess that I would be pretty anxious myself if I was asked to do this on only an occasional basis. And for this reason, it may remain a technique utilized primarily in tertiary pediatric centers. Some of you are probably wondering if the same concerns regarding general anesthesia and cognitive function apply to the older adult. Again, preclinical studies in animals have found an association between volatile anesthetics and the accumulation of amyloid beta protein in brain tissue, which produces a pathological picture similar to Alzheimer's disease. Fortunately, this has not been observed so far in human subjects, and there's currently no good evidence for an association between dementia and exposure to surgery or anesthesia. Nevertheless, if we look at the normal longitudinal decline in cognitive function that occurs as we age, there is an association of exposure to anesthesia and surgery with an acceleration in the rate of decline. And this is indicated by both the red and dotted lines in this graph. The acceleration is seen regardless of baseline health and cognitive function. In a subsequent study, the same group compared the rate of cognitive decline in patients who received general anesthesia or regional anesthesia. Both modalities accelerated the declines to an equal extent in global cognition compared to no anesthesia. However, if we look at specific cognitive domains, while both modalities were associated with a decline in attention and executive function, there was a greater decline in memory function in patients who received general anesthesia. Spinal anesthesia may therefore be protective in this specific respect. What about the more acute problem of postoperative delirium? Well, 
No difference has yet been demonstrated between general and regional anesthesia, somewhat surprisingly. It appears that perhaps the main driver here is baseline mental and physical status. This was illustrated by a study of depth of sedation in hip fracture patients having spinal anesthesia. Although there was no overall difference, when the patient's state of health was taken into account, measured by a comorbidity index, they observed that lighter sedation did lower the risk of delirium in the healthiest patients, and that there was a rising risk of delirium with increasing comorbidity in the light sedation group. Deep sedation, on the other hand, evens out the risk regardless of the patient's health. To me, this suggests that we should be avoiding general anesthesia if possible and minimizing depth of sedation, particularly in our healthy elderly patients who have normal brain function.